It's time for Defending and Commending the Faith with Joe Mott, inviting the atheist, agnostic, and skeptic to examine for themselves the evidence for the Christian faith. We are all limited by what we do not know and by the things we think we know but are not true. Dr. Joe Mott earned his Ph.D. at LSU and was a distinguished math professor at Florida State University for 38 years, helping to write three math textbooks and authoring over 30 research articles in math. He is now the host of this radio program, Defending and Commending the Faith. Here is Joe Mott. The proof of the Kalam argument is now complete. Let me remind you of the premises and the conclusion. Premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause for its existence. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Remember, this means the universe is not eternal. Conclusion, therefore, the universe has a cause for its existence. The first premise is self-evident, since things that begin cannot cause themselves. Support for premise one also comes from the law of causality or the law of cause and effect. Seven lines of evidence, as indicated by my acronym, SureJet, support the truth of premise two. See episodes 52 and 53 to see what the letters of SureJet stand for. These all point either to the universe not being eternal or to some fact that supports a Big Bang. Thus, the universe has a cause. Robert Jastrow, founder, director of NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Studies, and one of the most prominent astronomers of the last century, said, Now we see how the astronomical evidence leads to a biblical view of the origin of the world. The details differ, but the essential elements in the astronomical and biblical accounts of Genesis are the same. The chain of events leading to man commence suddenly and sharply at a definite moment in time in a flash of light and energy. That's found in God and the Astronomers, page 14. Jastrow continues, The scientist's pursuit of the past ends in the moment of creation. This is an exceedingly strange development, unexpected by all but theologians. They have accepted the word of the Bible. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. This is found in God and the Astronomers, page 115. He also said, Astronomers now find they have painted themselves into a corner because they have proven by their own methods that the world began abruptly in an act of creation to which you can trace the seeds of every star every planet, every living thing in the cosmos and on earth. And they have found that all this happened as a product of forces they cannot hope to discover, that there are what I or anyone would call supernatural forces at work is now, I think, a scientifically proven fact. He also adds, Far from disproving the existence of God, astronomers may be finding more circumstantial evidence that God exists. Many astronomers have downplayed the beginning of the universe from Lemaitre's Big Bang Theory because of religious implications. Sir Arthur Eddington said, Philosophically, the notion of a beginning of the present order of nature is repugnant to me. I should like to find a loophole. That's found in God's Not Dead by Rice Brooks, page 69. Later, Eddington reached a point where he had no other choice 
So then he said, the beginning seems to present insuperable difficulties unless we agree to look on it as frankly supernatural. That's found in Who Made God by Ravi Zacharias and Norman Gosler, page 55. Stephen Meyer, philosopher of science and best-selling author of Darwin's Doubt, Signature of the Cell, and Return of the God Hypothesis, said, you can invoke neither time, nor space, nor matter, nor energy, nor the laws of nature to explain the universe. General relativity points to the need for a cause that transcends these domains. And theism affirms the existence of such an entity, namely God. In short, naturalism is on hard times in cosmology. The deeper you get into it, the harder it is to get rid of the God hypothesis. That's found in The Case for a Creator by Lee Strobel, page 77. Now I want to change the focus from offering support to show the truth of the premises of the Kalam argument and to be able to infer the conclusion that the universe has a cause for its existence and turn to describe the nature of the cause of the universe. My objective will be to make a list of attributes of that cause so I can identify it with the God of the Bible, much like the way Prince Charming used the glass slipper to identify Cinderella. Rene Descartes gave the following statement as an axiom. There must be as much reality in the cause as in the effect. Given the nature of the effect, the contingent universe, and the fact that space, time, matter, and nature come into being with the universe, and because the cause is beyond the universe, then the cause of the universe must be something that is neither spatial, temporal, material, or natural. Thus we could say that the cause must be one, spaceless or omnipresent, timeless or not temporal, so eternal, third, immaterial or spiritual, and not natural, or fourth, supernatural, and five, transcendent over the universe, space, time, matter, etc. Things in the cause are silhouetted in the effect, the universe. Thus, if the cause were simply a force, the effect would have been there all along with the cause. Since we have given evidence that the universe began to exist, so the effect came about after the existence of the cause. So it follows that the cause cannot be a force. Moreover, the cause must have felt the need to have a universe chose to cause the universe and decided when to create the universe independent of any prior conditions. Therefore, the cause of the universe has three essential characteristics of personhood, feeling, intellect, and will. Therefore, the cause of the universe is sixth, a personal being with seventh, freedom of the will who can do what he decides to do. Thus, since the effect of the universe exhibits power expended and complexity, I conclude that the cause of the universe must also be eighth, extremely powerful, ninth, supremely intelligent, and abundant in tenth, knowledge. Later, I will show below that, in fact, since the first cause of the universe is infinite, then any attribute it has must be infinite as well. So then we will be able to conclude that this first cause is all-powerful, all-intelligent, and all-knowing. Consequently, 
The universe has a beginner or a causer since the Big Bang was the instrument used to bring the universe into existence, you could say the Big Bang required a Big Banger. Now, to show that there is an uncaused first cause of the universe, I need to take a temporary detour and discuss a dichotomy between what Aristotle calls the potential infinite and the actual infinite. Thomas Aquinas and others have made the same distinctions. In particular, William Lane Craig reports in his book On Guard that Ghazali, one of the advocates of the Kalam argument, claimed that an actual infinite number of things cannot exist. Also, Ghazali recognized that a potentially infinite number of things could exist, but denied that an actually infinite number of things could exist. These claims need to be carefully nuanced. When we say that something is potentially infinite, infinity merely serves as an ideal limit that is never reached. For example, in your mind, you could divide a finite distance in half, then into fourths, into eighths, and so on. The number of divisions is potentially infinite, in the sense you could go on indefinitely. But in fact, you can only do this in a lifetime a finite number of times. You will never have an infinite number of parts. The famous mathematician David Hilbert also prohibits actual infinities in his 1964 paper entitled On the Infinite, found in Philosophy of Mathematics, edited by Paul Bancaraf and Hilary Putnam. He wrote that the hypothesis of an infinity within finite or aggregate structures not only undermines the axioms of finite mathematics, but even the realities to which finite mathematics can be applied, making such infinities inapplicable to a standard universe. It is frequently objected that this kind of conclusion about infinity has been invalidated by developments in modern mathematics. In modern set theory, the use of actually infinite sets regularly occurs. For example, the set of natural numbers designated by the symbols bracket 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, brackets closed, according to modern set theory, is not merely potentially infinite, but has an actual infinite number of natural numbers in it. In my mind, I can think of the set of natural numbers and say it has an infinite number of elements, but I can only list a finite number of those elements in that set. In his book, On Guard, Craig answers this objection in this way. These developments in modern mathematics merely show that if you adopt certain axioms and rules, then you can talk about actually infinite collections without contradicting yourself. All this accomplishes is showing how to set up a certain universe of discourse for talking consistently about actual infinities. But it does absolutely nothing to show that such mathematical entities really exist or that an actually infinite number of things can really exist. If Ghazali is right, then this universe of discourse may be regarded as just a fictional realm like the world of Sherlock Holmes or something that exists only in your mind. I'm going to take for granted the claim made by Aristotle, Aquinas, Ghazali, and Hilbert. Thus it applies to the series of causes of the universe, making such an infinite regress of causes impossible. 
In his book, Baker Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics, the author Norman Geisler shows that no such infinite regress is possible. Thus, at the end of this regress is a first cause of the universe. This first cause is therefore 11, uncaused, and 12, limitless. That is, infinite in every attribute it possesses. This follows because everything caused is limited, and everything uncaused is unlimited, since there is no cause to limit it to what it actually is. I will continue to find other attributes of this first cause in the next episode. Thank you for listening to Defending and Commending the Faith with Joe Mott, a production of Wave 94 Radio in Tallahassee, Florida. If you have any questions or comments for Joe, please forward them to Doug Apple at Wave 94 at this email address, dougapple at wave94.com. And be sure to join us every Monday evening at 6.45 p.m. on Wave 94 and subscribe through your favorite podcast app, Defending and Commending the Faith, with Joe Mott.